Thank you. Thank you all for the warm welcome, even though it's a little chilly in here. <laughs> Certainly do appreciate that. <laughs> um, I am pleased to be here at the 2017 American Atheist Convention. It is a pleasure to be part of this organization. And I remember when I came to my first one in 2011 and saw Dave Silverman speak, it just propelled me, it, it compelled me to become more involved. And I'm very, very thankful to him for that. As well as to the friends and family and colleagues that I have come to know and love over these past few years, you are all very near and dear to me and I appreciate you for that as well. But today, thank you. <laughs> that makes me feel so weird, but thank you. <laughs> but today, for the next 20 to 25 minutes, I'm gonna do part two of what is my, of what is my secular hospitality talk, which is called, Everyone Ain't Gonna Make It. It's just the reality of what we do in this movement and or as, as organizers that with all of our hard work and the people that we were to connect with, the reality is that we run into some very bad apples and it is our responsibility and duty at times to manage that process. And so I'll be speaking on that in just a bit. So what did I just turn off? <laughs> okay, so Black Nonbelievers as an organization started in 2011. We've been going strong for six years and counting, because we plan to be around for a very long time. As you can see, we celebrated our fifth anniversary last year in 2016. We had some awesome speakers, and it was just, a, including Dave, including our lovely board member, Bree, who's in the audience today. And um, this is just a reflection, and just a short recap of what we've accomplished as an organization in these past few years. Um, we have built some great relationships with our members, people in this community, and the other organizations. And we're proud of that. Very, very proud of the work we've done and what we've accomplished. And, and we are the largest official organization that is dedicated to building the support and community for black atheists. But of course, none of this is easy work. Here's how we've been able to do it, and this has been our approach. I am, in my, my profession, I'm an event services manager. I have to manage a staff. And so we've taken what is a very pragmatic and business approach to the organization. I'm very, very um, happy to have a board that supports my decisions, and we work together to make sure that we are doing the best for our members and, the, and others in the community. So we started with, and this is something that's good for any organization and other organizers to have a clear vision, have good decision making, think about the people, and um, work through the checks and balances, and, uh, and all, treat it like it's your business. That's what we have to do, and develop, uh, develop that culture. We run and operate on a warm, festive, and friendly environment as well as staying true to our mission, which is helping the people who need us. And we've stayed on that path unapologetically because we know that through all the headlines, through all the sensationalism and other problems in the world, there are still people who need us. It hasn't been without its issues though. We've gone through people calling us sellouts, I've been called, uh, you know, I've been called a coon. That's a, that's a big word in our community. Because as much as we like to think that we're just this, we're not homogenous for one. And there is, this, there is this idea about the black community that 
we're just so downtrodden and fallen that we don't know how to make decisions for ourselves, that we don't know, we don't have differences of opinions, that we have no power and we have no ability, which isn't true. As an organization, we've had to filter through that. We do not tolerate racism, sexism, homophobia, transphobia, et cetera. We do not tolerate antisocial and harassing actions. And this applies to everyone equally, black folks too. So you don't just get a pass in our organization simply because you're black. And I know I'm saying this in front of a predominantly white audience, but I don't care. It's necessary for me to say. Because we have to hold ourselves accountable. Isn't this what we're about as a community as indiv and as individuals? Holding ourselves accountable. And this is what we do. But for other organizations, it would be good. You know, when I started attending the heads meetings, the secular leadership summits, as well as connecting and speaking with other organizers, I realized that we, have, we share quite a few of the same problems and we have to deal with a lot of the same things. So, being me, as just as a person, as a manager, as a mother, and someone who gen generally just does not take any shit, <laughs> this, these are some of the things that we have to do. I'm, I'm nice and accommodating, but at the end of the day, don't get on my bad side. <laughs> but we have encountered quite a few, and you should be aware of, blatant opportunists. There are people who will come into your organization with the sole purpose of furthering their causes and furthering what is only important to them. We've seen this from black folks, we've seen this from white folks, and that is something that we look out for in our organization. And I don't just make these decisions on my own, I consult with our leaders and organizers as well. And I'm happy to say that we share that vision. We are also, you, you also must be aware of those who want to dictate, but won't donate or sufficiently participate. What do they say about the ones who talk the loudest, but you know, those who talk loud and ain't saying nothing, and they're doing the least. And we've encountered quite a few folks in, my, in our organization. And so it has continuously become a vetting process for us as well as other similar organizations. Because when we're dealing with people, we're dealing with different personalities, and you know what? It's, a, it's an unfortunate part of the job, not even paid job, but it's, it's, a, it's an important part of what we do. Have to talk about something for a second, white privilege. We must recognize it, address it, and I'm not sure about this last one, but we should try to get rid of it as much as possible. I bring this up because so many of you and so many of us think that the idea of privilege and racism is overt and blatant and directly calling someone a nigger or another slanderous term. Excuse me, y'all can, can uh, censor that if you have to. But it doesn't always come in those forms. And as much as we like to think that we are progressive as people, we're not always. Supremacy pr and privilege comes in the form of being asked, what is our organization gonna do about black on black crime after I did a talk on secular hospitality? And then having a popular blogger chastise one of our board members for telling this person that what they asked was racist, trying to shame her as a white man telling a black woman that she was out of line for telling another white person that she, you know, for telling another white, for uh, uh, chastising or even correcting her because she asked a very, not even inappropriate, it was a very racist question. These are the things that we have to deal with. 
It also comes in the form of being asked to present an all male, predominantly white panel at your organization's expense at your personal birthday party. And it finally comes with the demand of being the only person to have been contacted to share their comped room at a conference. Yes, if you don't think some of the people among you are capable of doing this, think again. Y'all need to talk to us more than what you do. Because trust me, at this point, I can definitely write a book. Many of us can. So yes, these are your peers that you have to watch out for and that they are doing this. So if you want to know, definitely ask us. Everyone deserves a chance until they don't. And we have to become more comfortable with this idea. As much as we like to help everybody, we can. For your groups, for your organizations, for anything that you're involved in, you must set guidelines and expectations and then follow them. You must stay consistent and be persistent with how you handle not just people, but also your operations. Be proactive with your vetting process. There was a person who tried to get into our online Facebook group not long ago, a black gentleman. I looked at his profile, saw that he had a picture of a black family being shielded by an umbrella from the LGBT rainbow. Immediately, you do not get to join our organization. So it is good to be proactive. If there is anyone who seems like they just don't belong, you got to go a little bit further and it is okay to say no. Don't discriminate, but do be discerning. And this goes back to the previous point I made. Uh, we want to be welcoming. We don't just automatically want to exclude anyone because they may be at a place where we're not. There are still new atheists and people who are new to the community that are still dumping religion that haven't dumped other forms of indoctrination. And it is important to kind of, you know, kind of, kind of see through, you know, understand where they're coming from. Maybe they need some guidance. But if it is clear that they are, you know, that, that they are blatantly uh, not for the group or they're not, uh, they're not a good fit, that's fine. You're not discriminating, but you are discerning. Yes, try to help, not save. There is a huge difference. We shouldn't be a community that is trying to save anyone. That is for the religious community. They have built their identity around trying to save people's souls. We can't do that. We are human beings. It is impossible. We can't save people. People need to learn how to help themselves. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Of course, would help from us. You know, it doesn't mean that you just throw people to the wolves, that, that's not what we're about here. But again, the primary goal is to help people save themselves. Self-care is important. We are not machines, we are not robots. Um, I don't know about you or if you're on my Facebook page or if you are intimately familiar with me, but I work full time, I have three children. Um, I'm still running this organization, uh, it's a volunteer organization. I serve, currently serve on two boards. Um, even, I have to, even I have to rest at times. And no one who is in that position of responsibility should have to deal with anyone else's problems to the point where we're taking it on and we're forgetting ourselves that self-care is important. It is okay to just take a break. Also, there are some people who come to us with problems that are bigger than what we can resolve. 
Most of us can just do the, the basics, especially as local organizations. We try to, we offer help, we offer support, we try to offer resources when, when we can, but there are some folks who need some serious help. And that is not up to us to be their personal psychiatrist, psychologist, banks, or anything. We have to take care of ourselves. We can't help others until it hurts us because it will hurt us as a movement. So make sure that you, and I have to, this is for me too, make sure that we are taking that time to take care of ourselves so that we can continue to help others. But there comes a time where there is, again, there are just some people you can help that people have, there, there are some that have just exhausted everything out of you. And once you know that you have tried, you know, if you've done everything within your capabilities to help them folks, if all else fails, say, bye, bitch. Sometimes I gotta pull that founder's card because, again, there are some people who think they know more than you, and let me just say for the record that a degree does not necessarily qualify you to know more than someone else. You have to look at the practical things that folks are doing. Look at the work they're putting in, look at the time, look at the money, and you appreciate that more. And people, we also need to know our worths. You know, as much as we like to try to get everything done for free or as little as possible, it is not possible. And we have to learn how to value each other more as people and as with, our, with our organizers, leaders, and as organizations. Show that you appreciate them and let them know what their worth is. If you benefit from an organization, you should be putting more into it. You don't just take it for granted. And if there, are, if there are organizations that are doing what you can't do, then again, it, it, the same rules apply. So I will end with this. Again, we have, as an organization, we have built a strong and solid foundation in this community. People know who we are. I am very, very happy when people, I get teased about this quite a bit. When I introduce myself, someone says, I already know who you are. <laughs> and this is part of our new campaign called Be and Changes Lives. We have changed people's lives. Some of our members have said to us that we have saved their lives. We don't take that for granted. And in order for us to continue to do that, in order to maintain the integrity of our organization, there, the management process is important. There are some people that we have to weed out in order to continue to bring the good folks back. And sometimes it's a cycle. You're gonna have people who come. You'll have people who go. Not everyone's gonna like what you do, but you continue to do it. And that's a reality that we have to accept in order to keep growing and, and to keep building and to keep helping and supporting the people who need us. So just taking all of that into consideration that sometimes you got to just let some folks go and that's fine. It, it is okay. Thank you. That um, we may actually may have. Do you want to do? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Um, really quick. Can I confirm or is is we did have a switch up in our in our program? So I think we're waiting for our next speaker anyway. Uh, is is Shirley here yet? In the in the house, Shirley. No? Okay. Good. So we do have a little time. Um, so Q and A. Yep. Yes. Absolutely. Uh, we, do we have another another mic? I have a mic over here. All right. Perfect. Okay. Here we go. So let's do a little Q and A. Awesome. Uh, got this gentleman over here to my right. Hi, Mandisa. Can you talk about the chapters Hi. that you have? Yes. 
We currently have a total of 10 chapters or affiliate groups across the United States. The flagship is in Atlanta, Georgia, where we were founded. We also have uh, chapters in Detroit, which is headed up by uh, Bridget Crutchfield, who is sitting in the audience here. We also have um, a chapter in the or Metro Orlando area. We're also in Dallas, in DC, in Louisville, New York City, my hometown. And our most recent affiliate was established in the Portland, Oregon area. So, if you know of any black atheists or just atheists in general who are near one of our affiliate groups, point them in their direction. All of our, um, all of our groups have meetup pages and they can be found on our website. Another question here in the middle? Okay. Hi, Mandy. So, Hi, Glenn. <laughs> um, great presentation. Thank you. Um, I was wondering if you have any specific recommendations for how groups like this can increase the participation um, and membership of, uh, more, of a more diverse um, segment of the population, you know? Who? Oh, this is, uh, that tends to be a question that we get, uh, that, that tends to be a little daunting at times. <laughs> Um, it seems that uh, sometimes the organizers and the people, uh, they want to know about how they can increase diversity, but don't actually do it. I mean, we've been, we've been saying for years, um, do some further outreach. Sometimes you may want to offer some, uh, you know, some collaborative, spo you know, collaborative sponsorships. You know, if you know of, uh, you can perhaps raise some funds for some folks to attend if they can't afford it. Better, you know, better publicity and advertising does help. Um, and also this general idea that we're people too. <laughs> I mean, really, not, you know, of course, that's just on a, that's just general. But also, um, it's good, it, it'll be good, uh, cross-participation and support is important. How many of you know that Black Nonbelievers puts on events? Yeah, some of you, a lot of you should know. Yeah, we are, yeah, well, <laughs> I'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah, we are, we are putting on our first convention at sea, which is a cruise, this year in November. If you didn't already know, now you know. But um, yes, that will be important, the cross-collaboration. Um, just getting out there and actually talking to people and not at them. That's going to be really important. And actually showing that you understand what they go through. Hey, another one here to, the, to your left. Hi. Hello. Um, do you ever deal with any threats or safety concerns at all? Actually, no. Um, not as much as I... Not as much as we anticipated, but you know there are there are people who have been upset because they've been thrown out of our groups, um, you know, been cussed out. You know, not that anyone threatened to kill me or anything like that or kill any of us, but you know, sometimes you know when when someone's removed, they get a little disgruntled, and that that's okay, it's part of life. But as far as threats, no. Hey, anyone else? Yeah. Um, I guess that's it. Oh, All right. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, we're over here oh. in the front. Sorry. Uh, in the front. Thanks for doing what you do. Appreciate it. Um, Thank you. The question really is, like, for me, but it's also maybe for other people in the room that are involved with chapters. Mm -hmm. um, how do we get you and people you respect or people on your board of directors maybe to speak at our groups? What does it take? Money. <laughs> um, not just, you know, not as far as, um, you know, we're, I know I'm not looking for a payday in this movement. I didn't get involved in this movement to get paid. But putting together the resources to at least pay for travel and expenses, because there is no speaker that should have to come out of pocket for anything and if you have a larger group, 
Um, I'm the type of person who is a I'm a do what it takes type of person. If you have 20 people in your group that can contribute about 20 to 30 dollars towards a speaker's travel and accommodation, get them to do it. It really shouldn't take that much. And if you're affiliated with a larger organization, hopefully they have some funds set aside for some sort of travel that can be allocated towards a local group. It just really shouldn't take that much because I know that and what I have come to appreciate is that I know I have something to offer that is of value to this community. I should not be treated as some sort of servant that is expected to work entirely for free or out of my pocket. So that is, um, that it, that's it. And I'm, willing, I'm, I'm negotiable. You know, I, um, I tend to look for the, as an organizer, and I, when I book, I, because I organize and put together events, I understand the value of savings and trying to get the most, you know, get the most for your money. So I'm right there with you. <laughs> and I understand that our organization can't always pay honorariums and stuff, but at the very least, you can cover expenses. Um, there might be some that may want more, but if you respect what they have to offer, pay them. Another one here in the middle. Mm -hmm. uh, Mandisa, can you tell us about the event you're going to have in Atlanta in September? Yes. Who is that? <laughs> I'm sorry. Oh, yes. Uh, we Black Nonbelievers in Atlanta has a general meeting usually every third Sunday of the month. And our guest speaker for our, our meeting is uh, now the now Dr. J.T. Snipes, who has presented with the Secular Student Alliance for the, about the past three years in a row. Um, he wrote a dissertation. He, he's at, before I get to that, he is the son of a pastor and a first lady. And he wrote his dissertation about being a black atheist in college and his experiences. And so he will be speaking. He credits black nonbelievers as an organization as being a major turning point and a help for and a catalyst for his atheism. Because I'll tell you one thing, being able, seeing that there are black atheists out here helps a lot. It really, really does. So, uh, and also the event will be live, uh, there'll be a live podcast with the No Religion Required folks out of Savannah, Georgia. So we will be live on their program, um, listening to uh, Dr. Snipes, as well as interviewing some of our members. So if you are in the Atlanta area, this will take place September 17th. Um, yes, the 17th, the third Sunday, uh, yeah, third Sunday. So if you're in the Atlanta area or would like to travel to the Atlanta area, if you are a part of the group that's in the Atlanta area, any groups, come on down. Our group is, we welcome everyone. You do not have to, let me say this for the record, you do not have to be black to support us, you do not have to be black to wear any of our merchandise, and you do not, you, 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 just, you just don't. Because, and, and it's a shame that we have to repeat that at every single event that we have, but we do. So I'm just gonna reiterate that. You know, we are not the type, we don't. We don't do the separatist thing. And like I said, we qualify black folks too. So there's no excuses. There's no excuses for any of you. <laughs> Anyone else? All right, thank you.